Person. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Hassan, Ranking Member Romney. This is a really, really important hearing, and uh, thank you for graciously allowing me to ask the first set of questions. Um, this is a critically important topic, and the fentanyl crisis, like you all say, we all know this. It's devastating. It's devastating in my home state of Nevada, communities all across Nevada. The Southern Nevada Health District reported in February of this year that between 2020 and 2023, the number of fentanyl overdoses among residents of Clark County, our largest county in Nevada, uh, is increased by 97%, 97%. It's one of the reasons why earlier this year I returned to the southern border to meet with Border Patrol and CBP to find out really what those law enforcement officers need to help stop the flow of fentanyl into the U.S. And since returning, I'm really proud to have passed bipartisan legislation to address the fentanyl crisis, voting for increased investments in technologies that help and intercept drugs, but as to what you've alluded to, much more work needs to be done. And so I want to talk a little bit about C. We know we have the border, but uh, we have the C. So last week I sit on armed services at an armed services committee hearing, Southcom Commander Richardson, um, he, the general, he discussed our armed services' ability to detect and seize maritime drug shipments. They're coming in that way too. Uh, she said that even with intelligence cooperation with partner nations, they're only able to seize about 10% of drug shipments coming in by sea. So, Ms. Realuo, what steps can we use or to better equip our service members and DHS personnel to stop the flow of fentanyl? And also, how can we leverage our international partners to prevent that from coming here like we need to do with defense? So particularly in terms of maritime routes, we can use a lot of what we call actionable intelligence. My colleague, um, Christopher Urban, talked about Plan Columbia. We've developed over 20 years of real knowledge on how to intersect and more importantly intercept through international um, trafficking routes. And that really is dependent on international cooperation, which is the topic of today's piece. How do we build those trusted networks is a bigger challenge. I think you know it's not a secret that we've had a lot of challenges working with Mexico on counter-narcotics due to mm -hmm. corruption, to the extent that we actually arrested the top general who was implicated for just a couple of weeks, um, Cien Fuegos. So the bigger question is how do we educate also our own law enforcement, military, and intelligence officers to understand those patterns very, uh, very well. So with Homeland Security, there are trade transparency units that work against trade-based modern laundering. The question is, how can we create we have a system um, out of Southcom that General Richardson oversees, which is the Joint Interagency Task Force South, looking at now all illicit trafficking, not just cocaine, which had traditionally been looking at it. It's also looking at all types of things, contraband, people, money. Mm -hmm. So the question then is, how do we build that to be a broader kind of model um, to go after all the ports of entry, whether they be by land, sea, or now air? Because I think you've heard about the drones now that are That's crossing right. and dropping um, uh, payloads. Um, and these are the things that we need to really impress upon how we can keep abreast of all this emerging technology. So I look at emerging technology from the dark side of globalization. How is AI, for example, or how are drones are being abused and then more point exploited for the bad as opposed to the good? And we've seen the Mexican cartels very, very adroit at incorporating new technologies like crypto payments, like drones to surveil, figuring out where are the kind of weaknesses on our border, Nevada, Arizona. Um, and they're quite smart in the way they apply it. Um, but the bigger thing is how could we keep it abreast? And that has to do a lot with resources. Okay. Keeping our analysts really up to date with how new technology is being applied by the criminal cartels. Well, I appreciate you thinking about all of that because they're going to try to stay one step ahead of us, and our job is to try to think, uh, maybe outthink them, and to try to get one step ahead of them. But you talked about educating, and uh, we do need to educate our law enforcement. So that fentanyl guidance for law enforcement, of course, this week the president signed into law the End Fentanyl Act, that bipartisan legislation I co-led with Senator Scott and Chair Hassan. And this new law is going to help crack down on drug smuggling, requiring CBP to update it update its uh, outdated guidance more frequently so that CBP officers can have more information on how to better handle this. As you said, they're constantly uh, coming up with new ways to, uh, uh, to get these drugs in. So again, um, how, do we be, how can we be sure that um, how other nations are up to date? Are they up to date uh, on their fentanyl guidance documents for their law enforcement personnel? And then uh, um, 
to Mr. Urban, are, are drug enforcement personnel in Mexico, China, and other countries, are they receiving that proper training? So. So I work actually at the Perry Center where we are a, a, an arm of the Defense Department and through education and academic engagements, we try to share and more importantly export our best practices. I just finished a course for 46 um, mid-level to senior law enforcement and policy and military officers from 16 countries. So the idea is to understand now they were taught what the fentanyl threat that's coming to their countries. And I think you know that they've found fentanyl now in Guatemala, Panama, Colombia, and Costa Rica. So it's not just the United States and Canada facing this. So the big question is, how do you build that trust with your partner? And I know I also work with US North, uh, Northern Command and the Army North, and we're doing a lot of what we call confidence building exercises where we actually show, and uh, you'd be pleased to hear that the US military and law enforcement are actually teaching the Mexican counterparts how to handle fentanyl. So I don't know if you realize also we are not using canine units to the extent possible because the drug is so powerful on a human being, it actually overwhelms the canines who are quite valuable in terms of these things. But for example, maybe the Mexicans didn't know that until they attended the training. Right. So these are the types of ways that day by day at the tactical and operational level, they're actually quite good relations. The bigger question is how do we get to the political will at the strategic level to see eye to eye and understand that the threat of fentanyl is killing not just Americans, but Mexicans as well. And that's coming around, I hope. Thank you. Mr. Urban, do you want to talk about the international uh, cooperation, make sure they're receiving some of this training? Sure. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, I was overseas for 10 years. So with DEA, whether it's DEA, HSI, FBI, we develop relationships with our counterparts. And certainly over the last few years, that, that intelligence, that training, that information has certainly been pushed out to the field where we've, we've trained our foreign counterparts. For example, I was in Vietnam and talked about this very issue with my foreign counterparts. Mm -hmm. What we're very good at in DEA is certainly pushing out the international training component. So I'm, I'm very confident that that's happened over the last few years in terms of building capacity and, and their awareness of how dangerous fentanyl is and being trained on how to handle it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Langford. Thank you, 